New York City is known for its grand buildings and structures, and one of them is of course the Grand Central Terminal, located on 42nd Street. Housing all of the branch lines of the Metro North, as well as various subway lines, it's a wonder to look at in person. It's the second busiest train station in North America, next to Penn Station. But how did this historic landmark, seen in many films and is considered to be a tourist destination, come to fruition? During the mid-1800s, there were three railroad companies seeking a unified terminal in Midtown Manhattan. The Hudson River Railroad, the New York and the Harlem Railroad, and the New York and New Haven Railroad each had their own separate stations in this area. However, this obviously came with chaos, because going between the different railroads would become a hassle. The Hudson River Railroad, as the name suggests, came in from Hudson River. The New York and Harlem ran along 4th Avenue, what is now Park Avenue, and the New York and New Haven actually utilized the New York and Harlem's track. These three railroads each came into one general area. So in 1867, one Cornelius Vanderbilt proposed combining the Hudson River Railroad with the New York Central Railroad, and eventually merged them together two years later. He sought to build a train terminal that could house all three railroads. Vanderbilt had architect John B. Snook to design a new station called Grand Central Depot. The Grand Central bit came from, of course, the New York Central Railroad, but also because of the fact that a central station to house all of the three railroad companies was sorely needed. Construction began on September 1st, 1869, and it was completed by October of 1871. Now originally, trains would arrive on street level. This presented a problem as accidents with regular pedestrians became common. And so Vanderbilt proposed a solution in 1872, the 4th Avenue Improvement Project. This involved building a tunnel starting at 96th Street and going underground all the way to Grand Central. It was eventually completed in 1874, and you will know it today as the tunnel that is used by the Metro North on its approach into Grand Central Terminal. In 1885, Grand Central Depot had five platforms and had seven tracks added next to the existing terminal. The station itself was starting to gain traffic as its 12 tracks were filling up by the mid-1890s. By the end of the decade, Grand Central Depot had reached its capacity, carrying 11.5 million passengers by 1897. As a result, the main building was renovated and renamed to Grand Central Station. Oh, and there would also be a new waiting room that opened in October of 1900. Now, since trains used the tunnel to head into the station, that means smoke from the steam engine would build up. This eventually led to a train crash on the 8th of January 1902, when some smoke impeding the visibility of some signals caused the southbound train to collide with the train ahead of it. Fifteen people were killed in the incident, with over 30 injuries. A subsequent law was passed in 1908, in which the New York State Legislature banned all steam trains in Manhattan. But right after the incident in 1903, the New York Central Railroad's Vice President, William J. Willigus, wrote a letter to the President of the company, William H. Newman. In it, he proposed electrifying the tracks to Grand Central, and placing the entire length of the approach underground. He also proposed a new terminal building, which would involve two platform levels. In March of 1903, Wilgus presented his initial proposals with more detail. It was these proposals that would eventually become the basis for the Grand Central Terminal that we know today. The Board of Directors for the New York Central approved all of them in June of 1903, and $35 million would be set aside to complete the project. The previous building was demolished, and it was to be replaced by a much grander terminal. The entire renovation was to be split into eight phases, but the actual construction of the new terminal would only consist of two of these phases. Now during this time, yet another major railroad terminal was in its popularity during the early 20th century, the original Penn Station. Unlike the drab basement is today, the station used to have a grand terminal building just like Grand Central. Unfortunately, that building no longer exists anymore, but that's a whole nother story for a future video. Anyways, the construction of a new terminal for Grand Central Station meant that it would be competing with Penn Station. In other words, the New York Central Railroad was going up against its rival company, the Pennsylvania Railroad. In 1903, the New York Central created a competition to see which firm would be designing the new terminal. They eventually landed on Reed and Stem, and later Warren and Wetmore. The former was responsible for the design of the station as a whole, while the latter focused on the bow art style exterior. Even though these two companies worked together, they still had a tense relationship. Now when it came time to choosing the material to build the terminal, a display showing various stones was set up in Van Cortlandt Park, next to the tracks of the New York and Putnam Railroad. I say this because you can actually walk on the right of way of the now abandoned line, and to the left, you will actually see those same stones. Oh, and they ended up choosing Indiana Limestone, by the way. Construction on the new Grand Central Terminal began on June 19, 1903. As for the old Grand Central Station, it would be excavated and demolished in sections, as to not disrupt service there, as trains still served it. Over 10,000 workers helped in the demolition. On the 30th of September 1906, trains running through the Park Avenue Tunnel were electrified. In the following years, this was expanded to all three lines running to Grand Central. The last official train left the old Grand Central Station on June 5, 1910, and full demolition began afterwards. 
The remaining trucks of the old station were decommissioned on June 12, 1912. Finally, after almost a decade after construction started, the modern Grand Central Terminal opened on February 2, 1913. Immediately, it spurred development in the surrounding area. This included the construction of the Park Avenue Viaduct, a road ramp leading up to and surrounding the terminal. Now, along with the railroad station here at Grand Central, there would also be rapid transit lines that serve this area as well. On October 27, 1904, the IRT opened their first subway line from City Hall to 145th Street. One of the original 28 stops on the line was Grand Central Station, located on the 42nd Street. Following the dual contracts, the line would be split into three. For the sake of this video, only the 42nd Street Shuttle and the Lexington Avenue line are relevant to this story. The 42nd Street Shuttle would keep the original four-track local stop, but now it would be reconstructed into a three-track configuration with two island platforms. Track 2 was abandoned. Track 1 would still have a tunnel connection to the Lexington Avenue line, but I'll show you that later. Speaking of the Lex, it would open its own set of platforms at Grand Central in 1918, with a connection from there to the shuttle being opened as well. But back in 1915, the Flushing Line opened its own platform here, as part of an extension to Times Square 42nd Street. But if you go further back, back in the 19th century, you would find that the 3rd Avenue Elevated opened their own station in this area in 1878. However, after the opening of the subway stations at Grand Central, the Elevated Line became redundant. It was eventually closed in 1923, and if you're wondering, yes, I will eventually make a video about the 3rd Avenue Elevated. Now for the next couple of decades, Grand Central Station thrived. A record breaker of over 65 million people travels through the terminal in 1947. However, this was two years into the post-war era, and during this time, there would be major rises in two transportation methods, cars and airplanes. Grand Central Terminal soon faced a decline, and less and less people saw trains as a preferred method of transportation. In 1968, the New York Central Railroad hit bankruptcy, and so it merged with its longtime rival, the Pennsylvania Railroad, to form the Penn Central Railroad. This new company had wanted to demolish Grand Central Terminal, just like how the original terminal building for Penn Station was demolished back in 1963. However, this was disputed by the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission, which made Grand Central a city landmark in 1967. In 1970, the Penn Central Railroad went bankrupt, yet it still held on to ownership of the terminal. In 1975, the terminal was listed on the National Register of Historic Places and declared a National Historic Landmark a year later. Now, four years earlier in 1971, Amtrak was founded. One of its routes was along the Hudson, which trains used to head to Albany. However, the route didn't have any track connections to its main terminal, Penn Station. So, for a period of time starting in 1971, Amtrak trains that ran on the route along the Hudson River used Grand Central Terminal. That was until April 6, 1991, when the Empire Connection allowed those trains to run to Penn Station. Now, during the late 20th century, Grand Central Terminal underwent renovations. For example, in 1995, the MTA announced a $113.8 million renovation to improve the dilapidated building. Now, we're in the 21st century. In 2007, a new construction project began, the East Side Access. Now, at the time this video comes out, the project will still be due to open in December of 2022. However, if this video comes out in January, then I hope it opened by then, but knowing the MTA, probably not. Anyways, the East Side Access will bring the Long Island Railroad to Grand Central Terminal by having trains split from the main line at Sunnyside Yard. If you remember my introductory video to Secrets of the Long Island Railroad, then you would know that you can actually see the tunnel portals that lead to Grand Central if you're on a train heading through the Sunnyside Yard. Trains to Grand Central would then run through tunnels located right beneath the F train. This is known as the 63rd Street Tunnel. Once in Manhattan, LAR trains would then diverge off of 63rd Street and then turn south to head into Grand Central, where it would then terminate in a bi-island platform level configuration at the new Grand Central Madison Station, more than 90 feet below the existing Grand Central Terminal. In September of 2021, the 42nd Street Shuttle platforms at Grand Central Station were reconfigured as part of the 42nd Street Shuttle project. This involved the removal of Track 3, which now made the shuttle only two-tracked, and also the installation of an island platform at both Times Square 42nd Street and at Grand Central Station. Before this, the shuttle at Grand Central had two island platforms, with Track 3 in the middle. However, after the renovation, that track was filled in, making the new island platform quite large for more efficiency and accessibility. Okay, so that was the history side. Now I'm going to walk through the terminal and point out some interesting things. This is not going to be an in-depth tour, I'm just walking to some of the major areas. Now the terminal itself is divided into two platform levels, because originally, commuter trains and intercity trains served Grand Central. I'll start at the main concourse, which is on the upper level. This is what practically everyone envisions in their mind when they think of Grand Central Terminal. It's the most iconic part, being featured in countless films. At the center is an information booth with a four-sided clock on top. 
Towards the south end, departure boards are listed. Up top, there are shops that surround the main concourse, where you can also get some amazing views from. Now beyond the ticket office is the Vanderbilt Hall, located just north of the main entrance. It is now used mostly for events, but it actually used to be the main waiting hall. The chandeliers above are bow arts, each of them having 132 bulbs. Now there are three passageways on the east side of the terminal. The first is the Grey Bar Passage, located under the building of the same name. This was built in 1926, and it contains some nice artwork such as some clouds and even a 1927 mural by Edward Trumbull, depicting American transportation. Now the middle passageway is the Grand Central's food market, containing various shops. This area used to be part of 43rd Street itself. In 1975, a Greenwich Savings Bank was built here, until it was converted into the food market in 1988. And the South Passage is called the Lexington Passage, and it was originally known as the Common Door Passage, named after the hotel of the same name, which the passageway runs through. When the hotel was renamed to the Grand Hyatt, the passageway followed suit. Then during the 1990s renovation of Grand Central, it was renamed to the Lexington Passage, most likely because it's not too far from Lexington Avenue. Now moving on to the west side of the terminal, and you will find the entrance to the 42nd Street Shuttle, which then leads you to the rest of the subway lines that serve Grand Central Station. Now at the 42nd Street Shuttle, the platform is incredibly wide, because tracks 2 and 3 used to be here. However, go to track 1 and you can see that it continues beyond the station. This is where it connects to the Lexington Avenue line. In fact, you can see track 1 from a downtown 6 train just at the Grand Central Station. But what's cool is that since there is still a track connection from the shuttle platform at Times Square to the 7th Avenue line, that means that a train can technically run on the route of the original IRT subway from 1904 from City Hall up to 145th Street. Now, the Lexington Avenue Line platforms and the Flushing Line platforms don't have much going on with them, but it's worth mentioning that north of the 4, 5, and 6 platforms, subway trains actually run adjacent to the Metro North platforms. Okay, so back to the terminal building, I'm now moving on to the lower level, where the dining course is located. Here, there are a plethora of restaurants and food vendors to choose from. It's also here where tracks 100 to 126 are located. Other things to look out for here at Grand Central. At track 42, go to the very end to see the tracks curving left. This is what's known as a balloon loop, which takes the track around to the other side of the platforms. Or why not check out the Whispering Gallery, where you can hear someone's voice on the other side and vice versa. This is located in the dining course near the Oyster Bar. If you're feeling athletic, you can even visit the Vanderbilt's Tennis Club's court. Now I have saved the best secret for last. US presidents often had their own private train cars they rode on. They also had discreet ways of getting on and off those trains. For Franklin D. Roosevelt, he would have a secret platform here at Grand Central Terminal at Track 61. Since he suffered from polio, he would be driven off a train cart in a limousine, which would then be driven into an elevator to take him up to Waldorf Astoria. Now the way to get to that secret platform is confidential. However, I do suspect that this golden door on the outside of Waldorf Astoria at 42nd Street does lead down to Track 61. Also, if you're on a Metro North train heading out of the station on the rightmost track, look to your right and you might see that secret platform. And so that concludes this very long video about Grand Central Terminal. But I shouldn't even be surprised anyway, because a station with this much grandeur is bound to have a lot of history to it as well, which in turn means a lot to explore, which then makes a longer video. Anyways, if you did enjoy this video, then consider liking it and subscribing to my channel. I'll see you next time.